Hi, I'm John Atek. I have with me one of my very best friends, Johnny <laughs> Woods. And yep. um, we met in, uh, it was September or October 1991. Yep. And um, you'd just finished reading Russell Miller's Barefaced Messiah and you'd heard about this character called John Atek and you decided you'd better go and see him. Actually, yes, but however, I moved to East, Pres East Preston, West Sussex, and I read Russell Miller's book, and then I was trying to find John A. Jack, and I couldn't do it, and I got very frustrated and gave up, and I happened to be at a dinner party with a friend of my best friend in California, and we were having dinner. It wasn't nice. There was a Romanian appetizer with a cold, hard-boiled egg and some <laughs> other things. And so, but I managed to get through that. And she said, oh, tell me about yourself. And I mentioned the word Scientology, which I hadn't said to anyone. Mm. And she said, oh, you need to talk to John Ata. Mm -hmm. I said, what? And she said, I know him. Mm. And that's how I... I got to find you. It took a long time. Yeah. It, yep. it did. And we then, I, I was about to do an intervention with a, a young East German woman, and um, Ron Lawley was meant to be coming and helping me. And he, he, he lived about five minutes away from where I lived, and he did have a telephone, but I got a letter from him saying, you know, a week before saying that, that he didn't think he could do this. And you, Poor, poor you. You came along and said, is there anything I can do to help? And I said, yes. <laughs> and we had adventures <laughs> in the next few years. So we did. I want to talk to you today about um, a little bit about your background and then how you became involved in Scientology those several okay. years. Okay. Yep. So, uh, but if, if there are any sort of cold boiled eggs or anything along the way, do do mention them. <laughs> well, I was thinking the other day, because, you know, I'm writing a sequel to my book. Yeah. Tell them um, about your first book. What's your first book called? My first book is called Deceived. Okay. One, one, one Woman Stand Against the Church of Scientology. Hmm. And it's about my successful litigation in the high court where Scientology had to publicly apologize to me and pay some monies to hmm. make up for the fact that I spent eight years arguing with them about the fact that they are liars. Um, yeah, so I was thinking the other day, um, when I was trying to write my new book, which is called A Peculiar Treasure, because I am, um, you certainly are. I, I've been, I was trying to remember when I joined Scientology and I finally figured it out, it was 1973. Mm. So I left there 47 years ago. And I think you and I are celebrating our silverish friendship mm. silver silver anniversary friendship so i figured that out that was like 26 years so i figured out that the information that i have in my mind about scientology is half garbage from them and half figuring out the truth from you yeah well there you go <laughs> yeah i prefer the latter years mm. rather than the earlier years mm. yeah I remember the stories about you, you know, having a yellow BMW and hanging out with Hell's Angels and... Oh my gosh, yeah. What were you doing at university? Uh, well, I was a dual major. I was, a, well, actually triple. I was an English literature, psychology, speech therapy major. Yeah. Yep. And I met a man called Larry Kincaid. And he had a, well, that's a, that's a very dangerous part of my life. So I will just say that Larry tried to persuade me to read a book called Dianetics, The Modern Science of Mental Health. Mm. And I did. And I said, this is the worst book I've ever read. <laughs> I said, the writing style is so turgid. Mm. And this can't possibly be worth anything mm. and he said but I've always wanted to go down and go to that organization and talk to them about this wonderful therapy 
but he smoked a lot of dope, so I really didn't pay too much attention to that. But he, he couldn't find his way to the organization, consequently. Well, I was hoping not. However, on a, in a more lucid moment, he said on Saturday morning, let's go down to this organization in St. Louis. So I said, fine. So we went in there and they gave us a personality test, which was absolutely useless. And they had me listen to an introductory lecture. And I happened to be a psychology major in the master's program across the street because I taught special education children and they let me audit the courses there at the university. So when they found out that, they got so aggressive. Oh, <laughs> that was not a popular thing for me to have told them. So psych. I said, oh. huh? Say what? You were a psych. Exactly. And so they started saying all these disparaging remarks about my choice of major. And I thought, whatever. Anyway, Larry proceeded to go on the communications course and the registrar was clever enough to say, oh, that's a person that sells you things you need and don't mostly don't need. Um, so she said, oh, your boyfriend's gone on the course. So I thought, oh, I better go see what he's up to. And so I went on the communications course, which was a big mistake. And then um, my father, lovely, generous, man that he was decided to give me five thousand dollars just because he didn't want well he just had some dollars and said i'll give her some well he gave all four of us girls some so when they found that out they contrived a training and auditing package that just happened to if i bought some for larry too just happened to use up that precise amount of money astonishing what a coincidence amazing what a coincidence. And so I had some auditing and, uh, and I went to train to be an auditor. And um, a we weird things happened. In the first sessions, I recalled past lives and things. So that, that made me all the more determined to figure out what it was about. And then I, oh, I took a course. Now, I don't think there's anybody probably old enough watching this. It was called Super Literacy. Mm. That was the most horrendous thing you could do in your life. Uh, you had to look up the definitions of all the words Mr. Hubbard used on all of his study tapes. That was the, we used to call it the primary rundown. Yeah, well, it was primarily horrible, but yeah. um, I managed somehow to get through it. Mm. I don't know how. It was horrendous. Whew. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and that's every word in every tape on the study tape. Yep. You'd be looking up of the A and round and round and round. And did, did, didn't you have to go through it three times or something crazy? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oof. And at the end of that, you were super literate. Yeah, it, yeah. I was. Yes. Super bored. But I was super, yes, yeah, super bored. Um, but I love, I love words and dictionaries, but even, I'm surprised that didn't, you know, just <laughs> deteriorate my love for that completely. That stop you talking or reading all together. Yeah. Exactly. But it didn't, that didn't work. I did begin to read very quickly, which was weird, but hey, I don't know about that. I yep. think that was hypnotic induction. I thought I could read fast and well, and I could but I could before I started, so I just wasted money. Mm. Mm. Okay. <laughs> so now you're super literate. That's pretty good. I am. Yeah. Okay, so then I finished training to be a class four auditor. Um, I don't know if we should use all these ridiculous terms, but you can... That, that, that's, that's quite a long journey, isn't it? Because you'd have done the Dianetic, the Hubbard Dianetic Auditor course. Yeah. Later become the new era Dianetic Auditor course. You'd have done yeah. uh, the Method One course, Method One Word Clearing. You'd have yeah. done met Level Zero, Level One, Level Two, Level Three, and Level Four. Become an and Academy an, Auditor. And an internship. Yep. And an integrity processing specialist. Mm. Um, and then in they decided because I was such a cheerful little person that they I was best utilized body routine. 
Yeah, meaning bringing in new recruits. I was very, very good. Mm, I can imagine. I brought, in, I brought in 40 people, 50 people a week, no probs. Wow. And I did them a great favor, they thought, because I happened to bump into the man who owned Clark Shoes. And he was a millionaire person. And he, he came in because I asked him to come in and take a personality test. Mm. Yeah. And then I became the public registrar. Yeah. And that was a person who had to evaluate the personality tests of all the people that were brought into the organization. At that point, I think there would have been about 200 people in a week. Mm. So, um, Usually, I would go out and just get a whole slew of them in and then sit down and do their personality tests and put them on the course and go back outside. And that, that they thought that worked extremely well. Um, except for one time, there were women, but they, they actually weren't women. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that was really difficult because we had the wrong norms for the test. Mm. But they said, Bonnie, you can't have these people in here. I said, why ever not? They said, well, this is not going to work. And I said, well, I'm disappointed because they are looking forward to being here. Yeah. And then they said, just get them to buy a Dynetics book. Mm -hmm. But they didn't want to, and I didn't blame them. And I didn't want to say, hey, don't bother because it's really turgid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, still thought it was turgid, even after all that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah. So uh, a prohibition on transsexuals and transvestites and that sort of thing and homosexuals, all sorts of things that you're not allowed to be. Uh, you're not allowed to be a reporter or a communist either. Yeah. Well, I actually asked those people what did they consider they were and they said, we consider ourselves to be women. I said, okay, fine. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, of course, one of the most celebrated people in, in that community now is, is Kate Bornstein, who was a member of the Sea Organization and all of that, and is now an outspoken advocate for transgender people. Bless her. Yep. Yep. Okay, so that was the St. Louis Organization. And then, what happened? Then? Oh, I still stayed friends with the millionaire. Mm. And he, I finished the two and a half year contract and he hired me to be his nanny mm. um, and to help edit a book that his wife was writing about international folklore things. And basically he said, um, maybe you would like some, some more auditing or maybe you would like to go clear an OT. Um, and I said, yeah, that'd be all right. So he just, gave the regs an open ticket to write whatever I needed. Okay. Um, in, their, in their excitement, as you can imagine, <laughs> whew, I've never seen a registrar. I mean, my goodness. Mm. Talk about exterior with no perception. Um, <laughs> that registrar said, we think you need 15 intensives of expanded Dianetics. Which in an intensive is 12 and a half hours, so. Yeah, so I needed 15 of those mm. to do expanded Dianetics as a prelude to the, which was then the clearing course. And that's almost 200 hours of. Yeah, well, it was meant to be 200 hours. However, um, because you spend hours and hours listing all of your evil intentions on, mm on the whole track and trying to get rid of them. I'm sorry about all these words, John, you have to sort that out. Um, well, the whole track is the entirety of your existence through all of your past lives. <laughs> and you're meant to find out every rotten thing you'd done through that time. I mean, this is the kind yeah. of thing that Ron Hubbard, if he'd been ethical and honest about it, if he'd done expanded Dianetics, it would have taken him a million years to get through. <laughs> <laughs> well, I only got about halfway through those intensives because for some reason, I decided I didn't need to wear glasses anymore and had perfect vision. Yeah. <laughs> um, who would have known it was a hypnotic state? I mean, please. Mm. Um, so they sent me to an optician because they're so excited about mm. having a success story. 
Yeah. Um, but he said, I don't know why she thinks that. She can't see anything. She's nearsighted as, as ever. Yeah, I, um, I know so he interject a little story at that point. Helen O'Brien, okay. who was... Helen O'Brien was the head of the Hubbard Association of Scientologists from 1952 into 1953. So she was Hubbard's immediate deputy. She ran the Philadelphia doctorate courses. And in her book, fine book, Dianetics in Limbo, she explains that they put this sort of fishbowl on the reception desk to take all of the pairs of glasses from the people who had recovered oh. their vision, as had been promised yeah. in the turgid book, Dianetics. And she said yeah. by the time she left, nobody as yet had put their glasses in so if only you'd got there earlier you know they could have had at least one pair of glasses <laughs> well uh, yeah well i wasn't about to give up my glasses because i i thought well we'll see mm -hmm. um Quite so then i ended up going to los angeles to do the clearing course and the o2 levels in the interim there i began to um work for the apple schools which were schools that used L. Ron Hubbard technology in a primary school sort of effort. Mm. Um, I, so I started an Apple school in St. Louis and then I oversaw one in Kansas City and in Milwaukee. Wow. And my own. So I was doing that. And then I went to do my clearing in OT levels. I don't know what year that was. Let me mm. look at my timeline. Uh, and let's just interject that OT levels are operating Thetan levels, which uh, allegedly teach you to leave your body and perform miracles at will. Uh, as yet, nobody's actually demonstrated this, but heck, it's early days. It's only been about 60 years. You know. Well, fair enough. And on, on one of those levels, you know, you can explain to them, John, about the e-meter, but on one of those levels, um, I attained some state which they tried to figure out a name for um, because they couldn't get me to, the meter stopped working. It just flapped <laughs> for weeks and weeks. And then they said, oh, what you need is key to life. So Easy. then I, put, I went on the key to life course, which was really quite bizarre. And then that needle still flapped and flapped. So eventually they gave me some amazing certificate and said, Oh, you're at some level we're not familiar with. I said, well, that's been going on since I was born. Um, okay, so let me see here. Wait, wait, wait. Um, oh, I did the OT levels. Imagine that. I think around 1977. Okay. Yeah. And then I came back and married someone in the guardian's office on the day the church was raided. Yay. Hello! July 77, somewhere around there? July 8th. Yeah. The raid. He had to go immediately, right from the wedding ceremony onto the plane. Huh. Yep. Then I ran my Apple school in St. Louis, and then a Sea Org recruiter came through the town of St. Louis, Missouri, and she got a hold of my husband at the time and said, Oh, you can come and work in the Guardian. Well, not not anymore the guardian's office. I think she said he could be a, a supervisor of high levels at ASHO. And I could sort out the education of the children in the Sea Org. And ASHO is the American St. Hill organization, which is in Los Angeles. Right. Yeah. So um, I, I thought that would be a good idea. So we went to the Sea Org. And then things went sort of downhill at that point. That's not a good thing to do, not a good decision to go in into no, that. I, I somehow managed to avoid that. I, it, I was invited a few times, and uh, then they decided that because I'd taken LSD, they didn't want me any more than I mm. wanted them. So, so it worked out quite well, you know. That was a blessed escape. Because mm. we rolled up to the Hollywood Inn, which had no elevator, and our room was on the seventh floor. Mm. above the garbage chutes yeah. and um we had to walk from hollywood boulevard to asho carrying our two-year-old mm. um every day in the morning and then at night and it was quite a that's it was quite a horrendous time in the sea Org because you you just ate rice and beans morning noon and night and you worked 
you know, amazing hours and you... Um, but what sort had, of hours? What sort of hours would you be working? Well, you had to be on post at nine and then you worked on post until six. You had an hour for dinner and family time. And then um, you were supposed to study in the evening, but what usually happened is you had to work on renovating the blue buildings mm. because it was a hospital. Yeah, the city so had Lebanon, yeah. Yeah, you had to do um, really quite hard physical construction work mm. till um, 12 o'clock at night. Okay. And then you could go home. Well, home. We use that term loosely. If only I'd had ruby shoes. Yeah, it would have been so yeah. useful. So you'd have an, an hour, with, was this seven days a week or? Uh, pretty much because yeah. the stats were down. Um, the statistics were not good. So not enough money yeah. was coming in. I uh, not enough. No. Um, well, all of the different statistics were were not good. Mm -hmm. So we were on rice and beans and no liberty, no free days off mm -hmm. at all. And I think I didn't go outside for five months. Wow. Because because there were tunnels under the building, so you could kind of make your way around without actually going outside. Yeah. And I think I earned. I would be a stretch if I can remember correctly. It'd be a stretch to say twenty-five dollars a week. Wow. If you got paid. Yeah, and that that yeah. was for. Let me see if I've worked this out. Nine, ten. <laughs> uh, you were working um, fourteen hours a day, seven days a week for that. Yeah. 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 And then ninety-eight I, I, hour week. Yeah. Now, well, yeah. And then I got I got very very ill, and I was fortunate enough to have friends and on the outside of the organization who realized how ill I was. Mm -hmm. I had stage four endometriosis, and I had to have major surgery. Yeah. Um, I actually got to the point where I physically couldn't do any work at all so um i had a friend and he managed to get me into the cedar sinai hospital because i was fortunate enough to know one of the leading um a, he would have been a leading consultant in that hospital um about that condition as well as someone who delivered babies and i had met him once and he remembered me and so Nobody ever forgets you, Bonnie. Well, I used to go with the Sea Org mothers who were having, that was when they were allowed mm. to have children. Yeah. I used to go with them in their birth to help them, kind of like a coach. Yeah. Um, and I met Dr. Uzo Rice, and he was an obst obstetrician gynecologist from Cedar sinai And he used to do that in a charity clinic. And I was there with one of the mothers once. And he said, he was talking to me and I, he was asking me about my physical condition. And he said, I wish you would come and see me. I wish you would make an appointment. Mm. And then amazingly enough, a year later when I was critically ill, he um, removed the uh, six pounds of tissue and I was in surgery in that hospital, but he did that for me which was quite amazing, really. Mm. Oh, I'm glad he did. Yeah. Yeah. And then I came out of hospital, and then I decided I didn't want to be in the Sea Org anymore. Mm. So I was trying to do this thing where you have to go see every person. Routing to say, out. Yeah, to say you want to leave. Mm. And I was, in the meantime, I was staying in the birthing, and obviously that physically wasn't possible to get any better when they, would, they wouldn't bring any food or anything. Mm. Um, so I just didn't really have any money or anything. And um, I happened to go one Saturday morning, my ex-husband who was a dedicated Seward member, in fact, I think he might still be a dedicated mm. person in Scientology, I think it'll, must be coming up on 50 years, I suppose. Um, he said when we joined the Sea Org, if you, if you ever decide to leave, you'll have to do it by yourself. 
because I won't ever leave. Mm -hmm. So I said to him, I'm, I'm wanting to leave. And, and I said, so what do you want to do? And he said, well, I didn't think this would become an issue because I didn't think you would survive your surgery. So I said, well, I think you should um, take care of our daughter until I can get back on my feet again. And I walked out of the building. I can remember quite clearly the Fountain Building on Fountain Avenue. It was like a horrible birthing place. I walked out and the door shut. And I think I had $5 in my pocket. And one of the, I used to be the director of processing at ASHO. Um, that And so I took care of all the people who paid lots of money for their counseling. And one of those people was quite a professional cellist. And he came driving along in his car and he said, what are you doing? And I said, looking for some place to stay. And he said, well, I'm going to Florida to do some levels and I need someone to watch my cello. <laughs> I said, well, I can do that. And so he had a lovely little house in Glendale, and he just let me stay there. And then I had two friends, who, including my wonderful husband, who took care of me. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And there you and were. There I was. And then I tried again to do it properly and to go do all the right things you were supposed to do. Mm. And I went to see the ethics officer, you know, the disciplinarian person. And um, I went in and he showed me my suppressive person declare. Uh, you can explain these things. And no. I said, he said, well, you're gonna, we're gonna issue this if you don't come back. So I didn't know what to do. So I went out into the street and I went into a telephone booth and I didn't even have any change. I don't know why I went in there, but, um, and then, my husband now, Richard, was driving along in Hollywood and felt that he should come and find out what was happening with me. And he came to find me in the telephone booth, amazingly. Mm -hmm. And he said, what happened? And I said, this is my thing that says I'm a suppressive person. And he said, who gave it to you? And I said, the ethics officer in the American St. Hill organization. He said, great, let's go. So he took me by the hand. Now you have to understand that my husband is six foot two and over 200 pounds. Mm. So if he goes in one direction, I kind of have to go too. <laughs> so I came along behind him and he went into the American St. Neil organization up to the big desk and he said, I'd like to see the ethics officer. And she said, do you have an appointment? He said, I don't need one. Where is his office? And those office doors used to be locked, but Richard decided he was not going to wait mm. for anyone to open the door. So he kind of went through the door regardless, and I was behind him. And he scrunched up my declare, threw it on the desk of the poor ethics officer, who actually was a little bit taken aback by <laughs> that. And he said, Is this your rubbish? And he said, Yes. And I, and he said, yes, that's her declare. He said, well, she's coming with me. So, you know, you can do what you like about that. And we're going to pick up her child now. So you can organize that. And if you don't do that, I'll punch your lights up. <laughs> Can't say fairer than that. <laughs> well, I think it was an unusual exit from Scientology. It's surprising how often I've heard of such exits where, uh, a threat seems to work very quickly with yeah, it did. These, these people who have these wonderful superpowers and this tone 40 intention as they call it <laughs> they, i guess quickly. they i guess they thought richard was pretty tone 40. yeah he was not to be messed with. <laughs> richard, richard had had some slight involvement with scientology himself oh uh, yeah richard was on the communications course but the very when i met him yeah. yeah, he was a friend of my very, very, very best friend. Mm. And um, he he did the training routines, mm. but he said he he got he got he got disinterested when they got to the to the training routines numbered six through nine. Mm. Um, because he said they kept asking him to do things and he said, I've done all the I've done that already. When they asked him to touch the wall after about five minutes, he said, well, we're finished with that now. Yeah, I'm tired of touching the wall, thank you. <laughs> and he said, of the, 
<laughs> the poor person he was working with said, well, we need to carry on. And Rich said, well, that's not going to happen because there's no way you're going to ensure that I do that, is there? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Move over to that wall. Oh, oh. Yeah. Oh, maybe not. Okay. And and we. So, I mean, let me add. You know, on a personal note, I, I've known yeah. Richard for as long as I've known you. That so Richard, gentle. Richard is. Yeah, exactly. He's not only quite big, and and if you didn't know him, scary. I've never found him scary. <laughs> highly intelligent and deeply caring. And what he did yeah. with you there was was to protect you from yeah. this oppressive organisation. Yeah. And then we went to live, oh, well, we went to live in these nice little flats near the Griffith Observatory, but there were some Scientologists living across the way, uh, Seog members, and um, one day the girl decided to p put my suppressive person, declare, I don't know how she got it, but she did. And she taped it onto our front door. <laughs> and my neighbor said, there's been someone vandalizing your house. Do you want me to call the police? Mm. I said, no, it'll be okay. So I took it down and I handed it to Richard. He said, right. So he took it. And Richard loves, I have to say, one of his passions is, we call it gorilla tape. You know that tape that is, you can't yeah. remove it. Yeah. And he always has that available. So he went over to the flat, knocked on the door, and he said, um, he took it and wrote on the back of it, um, is this your, I think he said rubbish. Mm. I told him to say garbage because he wouldn't get it. But Yeah, he's English. Um, he taped it onto her front door. <laughs> and he said, don't, I wouldn't recommend that you, we have any more attempts at this sort of thing. Mm. And then he told our landlord and he made them move. Yeah. Fair enough. So Fair enough. Surprised. Yeah. So then um, Richard wanted to go to England. Oh, in the meantime, I got pregnant with my beautiful Andriana Edith Ruby, who's a policewoman. Yep. Um, so watch out, and, everybody. <laughs> yeah, she's <laughs> tough like her mom. Um, and um, I had 36 hours of labor absolutely silent mm. so katie holmes move over yeah yeah 36 yeah. hours of silence Shush. anyway then we then richard came home from work one day he's a carpenter and a builder and he said um my contractor isn't going to do any more with us at the moment and he said would you like to go to worthing i said well where is it yeah and he showed me on the map and he said, we need to go and we'll probably need to get married. And I said, well, wait on. Um, but well, I said, done that. I didn't like it. <laughs> Hold on, hang on a second. I said, okay, fair enough. The baby's born. It's not a shotgun wedding. We can go. Um, so he said, let's go. So he said, we need to sell everything. So I put it in the yard and out in the front and sold the bed two weeks before he left which Richard said was premature, but <laughs> hey, I had signs saying, come buy this stuff. Mm. Um, so then we moved to Worthing. Mm. Which is on the south it, coast of, of England. It is indeed. We live by the sea. And what, what year was that? Uh, 1985, mm. April 25th. Yeah. Now, as I, I recollect, you, you had a certain amount of difficulty after leaving Scientology. Difficulty? In what way? Well, well, actually, nothing is difficult after Scientology. <laughs> Everything is really so much better. <laughs> but, but you, I think, if I've remembered rightly, you found yourself in the situation that many people do when they leave, that, that you felt sort of you must have done something wrong. They must, you know, and, and that, you know, you had cer certain, I remember you talking about walking up and down the beach and... Oh, you know, yes. Oh yeah, I was just talking about that with Richard writing something in the new book about recovering from Scientology. And I think the problem that you have is that it, in my understanding, um, you have this, your own personality um, gets overlaid by the cult personality. Um, and 
you know, without the help of someone like yourself, you have a, a, a almost a battle going on in your mind where you're trying to decide how you can possibly um, have a genuine feeling about something. Yeah. Because if you have a genuine compassion or love, it gets overridden by the idea that that's probably not good and um the whole concept that everything that you do is a result of your uh transgressions and of course in my case having had so many hun hundreds of hours of auditing and particularly auditing focusing on my transgressions in my whole life and i think you have no matter how much you reason with yourself you have the overwhelming confusion and fear and anxiety that you're never going you're going to lose your life eternally mm. does that make sense yeah it does and and, it, oh. and it's a i mean i've met people who said that they stayed in scientology because they feared they would lose their immortality now yeah. which always made me laugh there is an l ron hubbard statement in fact about how can you lose your immortality but they didn't seem to know that one <laughs> you know how can you lose that you know i suppose if you're a jehovah's witness you can because they they wipe you out if you if you're not one yeah. of the chosen ones don't they um yeah. but you you walked up and down the beach you you for for some years you were you were yep. trying to sort out which bit of it was you and and where exactly you were. Yeah. exactly in fact um hang on a second yeah in my book, I like to quote Alice because I'm hoping that they will remember things that Alice said that might cause them to think. Mm -hmm. And it's worth um, noticing, noting that, that one of Scientology's most ferocious critics, Martin Gardner, also annotated the Alice books as a mathematician explaining you know, the depth and profundity of these books, which is tremendous. But Ellen um, Hubbard used them in training drills, so you'd <clears throat> read lines from them. Like my mum said that when she first walked into a, into the Scientology mission in Birmingham, first thing she heard was somebody going, "Off with her head." It <laughs> <laughs> was obviously the place for her, you know. So. <laughs> well, it's interesting because um, when I look at at Alice, uh, mm. one of the things that Alice says is but it's no use now thought poor alice to pretend to be two people why there's hardly enough of me left to make one respectable person wow Impressive. And that, that that is very much how i was and Aaron and hubbard could think of 13 impossible things before breakfast <laughs> and if you think about alice she sees the rabbit and he runs past her and she is got she's curious about this rabbit because he has a watch in his pocket and she runs after him and she just goes straight down the rabbit hole mm. never considering how she'd get out again mm. as did we all yeah absolutely so i think that when i was in east preston i mean fortunately east preston is such a quintessential place um and so far removed from what I had been um, damaged by, that I actually could recover a bit on the at the seaside, mm. but um, there was such a, a such a war in my mind about what was. I was beginning to think, well, maybe some of these things weren't true that I had been taught, but I had no way of sorting out what was true and what wasn't true. Mm. So you ended up just with this morass of confused ideas and things mm. which i think that um you know it's a great blessing to me that you helped me sort all that out oh, it was absolutely my pleasure <laughs> okay <laughs> and and then of course um over the years we you know worked together many many times mm. yeah yeah and i think i just wish you know it's my fondest desire that people who are have left Scientology in droves, which delights me. Mm. But I worry about their recovery. I do too. Yeah. 
you know, I, I mean, as you know, I was steamrolled into uh, withdrawal by 1996 be because yeah. it was just nothing left. My physical health was gone. My marriage was gone. I'd gone bankrupt. And the system was not going to protect me in any way. And so I, ha I had to withdraw. But in 2013, I realized that it didn't, you know, people would leave Scientology. They'd not become involved with the independence or anything like that. And they'd believe that it was gone from their lives. Yeah. And it wasn't because they hadn't actually looked at what I call the implants of Scientology, the way that yeah. ideas are pushed into you, which will remain afterwards. And people will, the, the significant and central problem is that Scientology is a way of cloning Ron Hubbard. It's a way of yeah. turning somebody into a malignant narcissist who will be completely selfish and have no care for anybody but themselves and their own superpowers. And mm. it, Parts of that remain, and, and you have to address it. You have to say, what do I now believe? And it's not a matter of sitting down and having thousands of hours of counselling to undo it. It's usually a matter of just getting that first step where you say, that doesn't make sense. That thing I've been taught about the eight dynamics, you know, as a way of evaluating how to live my life, it doesn't work. It's nonsense. And when somebody's made that baby step they can keep on challenging i remember when i first met um sarah vosper who i came to to know very well over the years and and to like very much he wrote a book called the mind benders he spent 14 years in scientology he met elwin hubbard on a number of occasions but he he said to me when we first met that he'd still 14 years or so after leaving 16 years after leaving in fact he still would find himself crossing the street and wondering if he'd just committed an overt. You know, that he still saw the world in the way that Ron Hubbard constructed it, which is actually a very paranoid world. You know, it's a very yeah. scary world. And it, in most ontologists, their underlying level, certainly with C organization members, is fear and, or terror. You know, it's one of those two things that how am I going to get my st my stats up by two o'clock on Thursday? How am I going to um, keep on pleasing, you know, following and upholding command intention and doing mm. what Ron wants and all of this? They lose themselves. But mm. after people leave, it carries on. And they think that maybe by getting rid of the language, by not using words like overt and motivator and, you know, these mm. literally thousands of of words that Hubbard spewed forth while telling you that if you had misunderstood words, you, you'd be um, incapable and, and you would attack the source of those words. He nonetheless spewing them forth. But you become trapped in the concepts that those words, you know, he, there's this deception that you don't understand concepts because you don't understand the words. If mm. you take the words off the top, it's like taking the top of the sting off and leaving the sting in. So I found with many people, and there's this trap, which is you can't see it. You don't mm. know it. Um, when Leah Remini wrote her fine book, Troublemaker, she, she makes this statement, you can take the girl out of Scientology, but you can't mm -hmm. take Scientology out of the girl. Now I wrote to her, having read that, and offered to take Scientology out of the girl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This all, you know, going through aftermath, it never happened. That it was yeah. still about, you know, the, you know, not diving in and getting to that. And you know that I can sit with somebody in a single day. Mm. But they don't have to spend decades in this. And they will come out and they will be able to do the thinking and separate, you know, their authentic self from yeah. the programming or which word I don't like, the implanting that Hubbard put in there. So it, it becomes very complicated. I think that. Um, when I was living in East Preston shortly before I met you, um, before we moved to um, East Grinstead, um, I, my mother passed away in America and I, I, think that, I think that a trauma like that, um, I was thousands of miles away and I had to get home and when I came back I was Richard would have to take the phone away from me because I was really convinced I could just call her. Mm. And I went into a, a quite a, what I would call a breakdown. Um, 
because I think that the one thing in my life that was stable, which was a parent that I loved, mm -hmm. was no longer there. Yeah. Both parents were gone. So that, that kind of must have represented to me all the stability I had in my mind was from their influence on my life. Mm. And now they're gone. So now all I have left is this shattered remnant of this bizarre philosophy. Mm. So, and trying to sort it out was impossible. So I would just walk from East Preston to the next town of Westington and I would just walk up and down the beach and I would go to the library, take out seven novels, read them and take them back. And that went on for a month. Mm. And I just read novel after novel after novel. And then I could actually became so unwilling to go outside the house. I could actually go in our little toilet room and downstairs and get between the toilet and the wall, trying to find a place that would have boundaries on it. It was that serious. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's, that's strange because it reminds me of when I first met um, the famous, the notorious Captain Bill Robertson. And Bill had been, he'd been a Mississippi um, motorcycle cop during the yeah. civil rights movement. So who knows what he was up to then. He then, yeah. in the early 60s, he rose through the ranks to become, in fact, the Organization of Scientology was Elron Hubbard Commodore, Mary Sue Hubbard Deputy Commodore, Captain Bill Robertson, second Deputy Commodore. So he, he was right at the top. In 1982, he was hurled out. And I met him in 1983, and I got this story originally from a friend of his whose house he'd gone to, that Bill had asked for the smallest room in the house. Mm. Said, but that, that's not good enough. And Bill was a big guy. He, he was six three or something, six four. And he said, you know, did he have a closet that he could? And he ended yeah. up spending yeah. time inside a yeah. wardrobe because that was as much space as he could deal with. Yeah. And it's interesting to me that when I was involved in litigation, because as you know, we were in litigation with Scientology um, for seven years, mm. uh, litigating in person for um, five of them, I guess. Mm. We had 27 interlocutories. Um, at, just as we approached the final stage, which uh, my Queen's Council said I would have been on the stand for 19 days. Yeah. Um, I, I actually, that kind of consequence. And by this point, you know, I knew everything that I needed to know to mm. eradicate the damaging effects of it, at least from the perspective of sorting out what was true and what was pernicious lies. Yep. Um, but I went to a, a Christian retreat <clears throat> and Richard and Andreana were quite concerned because they gave me a little tiny room. I mean, it was literally a bed and a desk. Yep. And the walls, were, they had made lots of rooms, very, very small. Yep. That was the best thing ever. Yeah. And, and again, I went down on the chines in Bournemouth to the sea and walked back and forth on the seafront for days mm. till I could get my head around the idea that I could finish this litigation and be on the stand. Mm. But, but then, of, of course, I wanted a public apology mm. for the defamation of my life. <laughs> huh? mm. And um, they didn't want to give an apology, but then I said, well, then we'll, we'll just go to court. Mm. At this point, they had already dropped all of their um, counterclaims against me yep. because um, I had won the right to see their levels material in discovery. Well, we pushed to have the OT levels put into discovery, but it, yeah. that, it wasn't a counterclaim. They filed the original suit against yeah. you. Your yeah, they did. Yeah. So they're having yeah. been intimately involved with that litigation. Yeah. Um, and there was so much litigation because it wasn't just the libel action and then um, my solicitors <coughs> uh, 
put forth a counteraction and mm -hmm. then they were suing, Narcanon was suing me. It was ridiculous at one point. Narcanon was suing me. I think I got up to 10 cases in the end. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I, I don't remember how many. But at the, when we got to the hearing where um, we were, my young barrister um, was asking for the, she was wanting to prove that what I had said in the leaflet, uh, what the Scientologists don't tell you, <clears throat> she was, they were insisting that I prove every sentence of it to be true. And she mm -hmm. said, we need these materials to prove that Scientology is a bogus and counterfeit religion, which is our favorite slogan. Yep. Um, and so um, we were, the, when you get to that level, the, um, the master, who's hearing that particular hearing tells you ahead of time what his result what he feels he's going to rule mm. he does that in because they're very keen obviously at interlocutories to have people settle it so that it doesn't become yeah. a, a burden on court so he told ourselves and my young barrister and the qc's from grayson that were always keen to help us and they said um, to myself and, and to <coughs> Scientology's uh, solicitor, Peter Hodkin, and their counsel, Nathan, that he was going to rule that I could have those materials. Mm -hmm. So they ran out in the hallway. They wanted a, 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 you know, a time to talk about this or something. Anyway, <laughs> I love that master. <clears throat> because he said, well, I'll give you um, a half an hour. He said, because the media are very, you know, they're getting very restless. Outside well, the media the he was referring to were there for Stephen Lawrence's case, nothing to do with Scientology. Mm. But I think he enjoyed kind of ruffling their feathers. Yeah. So they came out into the hallway and Nathan called Alexander over and said, um, did I want to settle and did I want to, I think they wanted to give me 20,000 and, you know, drop everything and whatever. And so she skipped over there. She was quite delighted to be um, opposing, you know, a council of such repute mm -hmm. when she was a junior barrister. And she came skipping back and she said, Bonnie, this is what they're saying. And I said, oh, well, no. So she went skipping back, no. <laughs> so then, um, we went back in and the, and the master said, well, if you're unwilling, he said, if I would like to rule. And they said, well, we would like to just drop everything. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we want to discontinue our claim completely now. And he said, well, that's fine. He said, but Mrs. Woods has the right to an undertaking from you that she can publish whatever she's put into discovery. Yeah. So that was significant that I can talk about whatever's in discovery yeah yeah it meant that pretty much i mean by the time we got there i'd put together a, a huge mass of documents to yep. to show them that um if they did want to go to court then we were going to discuss all of the material about harassment that we'd put together all of the material about yep. their ot levels their past history and it meant that yep. pretty much you and richard had carte blanche to say whatever you liked about scientology yep. Yeah. And your own lawyer legal team really didn't expect that they'd be willing to sign such a thing, but they were desperately get out of court. Because there were little prepositions in the undertaking, um, you know, that I could talk about all of things. Mm. And, you know, there, she's, she was surprised. She mm. said, oh, Bonnie, I'm not even sure that, she said, I've written it as broad as I could possibly conceive. She said, so that you have total freedom to communicate about whatever you've done in this litigation. And she said she was absolutely, she was just cops wrecked that they mm -hmm. signed the undertaking. And they made a, an apology in, in court. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Then they went and told the media that it was out of the kindness of their heart because of <laughs> suffering that they'd withdrawn. <laughs> yeah. <Same dogs>. Yeah. <laughs> I think the major newspapers like the Times and stuff found that quite amusing. Mm. 
you know, considering. I was very keen to have the apology more than anything else. I think that's what kept me going through the litigation. Although there were times when it was desperately hard to litigate yeah. in the high court, specifically as litigants in person. Yeah. Um, but what kept me going was the idea that they would have to apologize mm. for what they'd done. Mm. I mean, um, um, what was, an, an, and eventually Alan and Overy came in and saved the day. And so you had one of the top yeah. firms in the world. I mean, when we, yeah. we were so impressed with um, Alexandra's work that, that my brother yes. said, well, how much does she charge an hour? <laughs> yeah. and it was 420 pounds an hour. <laughs> yeah, I think they, I think we've, I think at the end, um, Ellen and Overy were working pro bono mm. um, because unbeknownst to us, um, there were some wonderful anonymous people demonstrating that. And there was a wonderful character called Dave Bird. Yeah, I and remember. He, he had some connection to Liberty. And so he had said to me, Bonnie, I'm gonna to write to Liberty on your behalf. Mm. And Liberty wrote to us and they said, we, re we really would love to help you. However, we're not a large enough organization to take on such a litigant as the Church of Scientology. And Liberty we is sort of like the ACLU in, in yeah. the well, not dining. Well, Richard and I thought that was hysterical because it was just him and me. <laughs> yeah. And then a word processor and some books from the law books from the library. Mm. Um, but um, what happened then was interesting to me because he did write to Liberty and then we thought nothing of it. And then um, one day there, um, I got a letter in the post and it just said Allen and Overy, and it said, Mrs. Woods, could you call us, please? Mm. And it just had a uh, the name of my um, wonderful solicitor, Sharon, at the bottom of the letter. Mm. So I thought it was Scientology winding me up. Mm. <laughs> so I, I asked our friend Ron Lolly, yep. and I said, um, I think this is just a wind up. He said, well, I don't know. I'll you can try to find out. And he came back and he said, well, it's an actual law firm. Mm. And I said, well, that doesn't mean it's real, you know. So I went up to London to um, visit a friend in King's Hospital. And I said to Richard, I'm going to go over and see where it is. And I came out of King's and there was a big double-decker bus waiting and it said St. Paul's on it. And I knew that Alan and Aubrey was across the street. So I went up to the bus driver he had no one on the bus. And I said, I'm trying to get to this address. He said, oh, I'm on the other end of my route. So he said, why don't you come with me? He said, and I'm going back that way. Mm -hmm. So I'm riding along on this big bus. And he said, I'll just pull around there so you can get off. And I got out and I looked at it. And I thought, well, it does exist. But I still didn't go in. But then when I got home, Richard said, oh, for heaven's sake, give me the phone. Mm -hmm. So then I called. And then Sharon answered her extension and she said oh thank you for calling and she said would you mind if we represented you <laughs> she said we heard about your case from a panel that we're on once a year they have a pro bono panel where they pick cases the major law firms each pick a case that they believe represents civil liberties and they had just finished a section of that section of cases about death row cases in America and they were looking for a different sort of approach. So that was why I had so many people available because a memo would go out to the 1500 staff at Allen Overy, did anyone want to work on a pro bono action? Um, because they like to have that on their CV. So she said, do you mind if I call Mr. Honkin and ask him to direct your correspondent, his correspondence to you to us? <laughs> I wish that had been you know, that was a conversation I would have liked to heard. Mm -hmm. And she called back later and she said, well, that was very interesting, Bonnie. She said, I called him and he thought I was calling in regards to litigation they were involved with concerning ITV and those horrendous commercials. Mm -hmm. um, and she, she said, no, Mr. Huck, and actually I'm calling on behalf of Mrs. Woods. And she said, he doesn't 
say a lot. She said, I didn't get to know him very well. I said, why? She said, all there was was a sharp and take a breath. Mm. <laughs> so that was, I mean, that was amazing, really, what they did. Because oh. we were definitely on our knees by the 27th interlocutory. Yeah, I, I remember it well. Uh, I, <laughs> we had many a phone conversation along the way. Yeah, you, you had to have a lot of super glue in those days. <laughs> Put that girl back together. Yep, but we made it. And yep. this is perhaps a, a good time to stop this particular interlocutory. And yeah. um, you know, we'll maybe pick up somewhere else and talk about okay. 1,007 other things that... that <laughs> okay. And okay. It, just let me say that, it, as, as always, it's been a, a great, great pleasure talking with you. And, oh, um, uh, it's one of, the, one of the things I look forward to most, is having a chat. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that, you know, from the day that you first walked through my door, we, we have been <laughs> the best of friends and we Amen. we went through some pretty <laughs> dreadful <laughs> times together. But um, yeah. th we always had, you know, ginger ice cream and yep. and uh, the A.A. A. Milne stories to, to keep <laughs> us going somehow. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> OK, so this has been, been my my lovely guest, Bonnie Woods, and um, uh, I thank you very much for, for, for being with me here. Thanks well, a lot. thank you for having me. Yep. Bye.